Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate, and bite sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. Hello and welcome. I'm Amanda Farmer, and I have with me today Rena Van Alst from Strata Central. Hi there, Rena. Hi, Amanda. How are you? I'm doing great. I am part of the way through another busy week in Strata and it's nice to take a break and chat with you. Yes, likewise. (laughs) Let's start here. Hit me up with your challenge for this week, Rena. Well, this challenge, Amanda, has actually occurred now, I think, on three different buildings with three variations of the same issue whereby there is a leak that's been caused by a burst flexi hose, which we know is contained within the apartment. Another one had a dishwasher hose that's leaked. No, two of them, sorry, were both flexi hoses and one was a dishwasher leak. And what happened in one of the scenarios in the scheme was the floorboards of that owner were damaged and unfortunately those floorboards were installed by the lot owner. There was carpet originally. And initially we submitted a claim and it was rejected and after that the claim was reopened for some reason by the insurance company and they said, yeah, no, we can pay the floorboard repair the insurance broker has accepted the claim however the excess during the period that it occurred was ten thousand dollars so therefore the ten thousand dollar excess would have to be paid so the committee then came to me to seek my advice and I mean this has been happening I think with many schemes if you have too many of these they actually impose a condition that you have them all inspected because even though it's a lot owner issue some owners corporations will make the lot owner pay however some people have done a renovation they've updated it so it's sort of and some buildings will say no we'll look at every single one and we'll repair them because everyone's sort of paying through their levies anyway so there's different thoughts about how to address this but and the pressure is coming from insurance companies about this risk that's causing a lot of damage so anyway so the committee asked me and I thought well we don't own the floorboards they were installed by the owner and also the cause of the water leak was a burst flexi hose which is not common property it's within the lot. So we went to the owner and we said, well, you know, these are the facts. We want you to pay the excess. And then she refused because initially in the period prior, it was only 2500 for water damage excess. So therefore, the, the excess had increased. Anyway, and so there's been back and forth between us and we offered to pay half the owner's corporation because she said that the other complicating factor in this also was that floating floors were included in the policy. So she could not basically go to her own insurer and get it covered because we couldn't issue a letter of denial to say that they weren't covered because they are covered under our policy. Mm -hmm. So the question is, Amanda, and in another scheme, we had someone else's flexi hose cause damage to their wardrobes, which are, again, a fixture and are covered under the policy. And Mm -hmm. the insurance company will obviously pay the cost less the excess. And again, we've asked the owner to pay the excess and she's saying that, no, I don't have to pay the excess. You know, she said she went to fair trading, blah, 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 and they said you don't have to pay it. So my question really is, I mean, when it's a lot owner issue, does there need to be a bylaw to allow the owner's corporation to pass on the responsibility of the excess being paid or is it just the fact that it is a lot owner issue which has caused the damage and therefore that lot owner should then pay the excess? Yeah, okay, so there's a lot there. Um, the first question is I would think whether the owner's corporation has to make an insurance claim at all. So I think we've talked about this previously in another chat, Rena, where there was a flood from one unit to another. I don't know if it was a dishwasher hose issue or, you know, a sink just overflowed. No, I, think was a, I think it was a hot water system that burst, I think. Hot water system. And there was damage from one lot to another. There was no common property involved. And I think in that chat we discussed that it was open to the owners' corporation to say, well, this is a matter between lot owners. The yeah. owners' corporation doesn't have any obligation in this situation there's been no failure of the common property it's kitchen that doesn't otherwise need to be waterproofed yeah it's an accident sorted out between yourselves yeah and my position was that it was open to the owners corporation to do that and and a lot owner cannot force an owners corporation to make an insurance claim even if the event is insurable now we had some listeners who wrote into us after listening to that episode and saying that may not be the case and there is provision in the Strata Schemes Management Act for the tribunal to order that an owner's corporation make an insurance claim 
that section in our New South Wales legislation is section 174. The tribunal may, on application, order any person who is entitled to the benefit of insurance taken out under this Act to make or pursue an insurance claim in relation to damage to the building or any other property to which the insurance relates if the tribunal considers that the person has unreasonably refused to make or pursue the claim. So my question for the owners corporation would be, A, have you decided to make the claim? And if you have decided not to make the claim, consider whether that is a reasonable position because this lot owner, having heard that you're not going to make the claim, may be aware of their rights under section 174 to seek an order. And then that will be the question before the tribunal. Was it reasonable for the owner's corporation to not make the claim on the basis it was a $10,000 excess? And that might be a reasonable position. Uh, So Amanda, sorry, I think we need to go back one step. I think because the owner's corporation decided to make a claim. However, she went to her own insurance and because floating floors are included in our policy, she couldn't claim that under her own policy. So therefore she had to come to us to say, it's not included under my policy because it's included. We couldn't give a letter of denial. So if, if we denied and said, no, it's in some policies, floating floors are optional. They're not always included. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. in our policy, it is included for that particular building. And therefore, there was no other way for her to be a, like her own insurance said, unless you get a letter of denial to say that it's not covered under your building policy, which it is, therefore, we can't honour your claim as an individual lot owner with personal contents insurance, which had a much lesser excess of, I think, $500 or something. Yeah, but uh, we're still talking about covered or not covered, and Section 174 acknowledges this. Yeah. If the event is covered, it is still open to the owners' corporation not to lodge that claim. Yeah. And Section 174 then opens the door for an owner who says, hey, this is covered. Insurance would have responded to this, but the owners' corporation won't make the claim. I want you, tribunal, to force the owners' corporation to make this claim. The owners' corporation can say, well, we believe that we have made the reasonable decision not to lodge this claim because the excess would be $10,000 and this is a circumstance where we don't have a dog in this fight. There's no failure on our part. It's an unfortunate event. Yeah. But it's not our problem and I'm just, you know, stream of consciousness here. It's not our problem that this owner has not covered her floorboards in her contents policy, which I have to say as the owner of a fully renovated. Oh, no, she had, no, she, she had covered it, Amanda, but they said they need a letter of denial from our policy first because they know that some strata policies do contain it and you can't yep. double insure. So she had insured it, but she wanted a letter of denial from our office, from our insurance company to say yep. they're not covered, but they are covered. So that's why yep. she was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it wouldn't be a letter of denial that she'd be going back to her insurer with. It would be a letter if the owners' corporation chose this path. It would be a letter from the owners' corporation saying we are not going to lodge the claim. Yeah. And then it's a matter for that owner or perhaps her insurer to decide what its next step is, which may be a Section 174 application and the owners' corporation might want to get some legal advice as to how its position would then stack up. So that's sort of where my head's at with the insurance discussion. And it might be that an owner's corporation who says, okay, having heard all that and that she has that right, we don't even want to go down that path. We're just going to lodge a claim, face the excess, whatever. Let's just resolve it and move on. No, no, no. We, we said Amanda that she had to pay the whole excess and she refused. And there was That part I agree. You have no legal ability to recover the excess from her unless you have a bylaw and then that bylaw would have to be carefully drafted a bylaw that empowers you to do that. Okay. That so I agree with that part. Once you go down that path, you are going to be stuck as an owner's corporation with the excess, but I'm not convinced you have to go down that path. And then I go all the way back to the first thing I thought of when you said owner installed floors, what were the terms of approval for that flooring installation? Because I suggest that buildings are very careful when they're approving any kind of renovation work, whether it's minor, which is flooring, or whether it's major renovation work, like a bathroom renovation, that you have in the terms of your approval, whether it's a meeting resolution or a bylaw, very clear words that the owner cannot claim on the owner's corporation's insurance for any loss or damage that may arise from the existence of these new items that have been installed, that is flooring. So the only reason this is such an expensive fix is because these are floorboards that have to be replaced rather than carpet, which would be much cheaper. The only reason floorboards have to be replaced is because the owner has installed them. So there should have been, and I appreciate maybe a long time ago, might not have these terms of approval, but just 
helpful for future. Yeah, it was a long time ago because we've only taken this building over two years ago and it was way about 10 years ago I think she put the floor boards in. Right. So this is the reason why we strata lawyers spend a lot of time and buildings get frustrated that their bylaws end up being pages and pages long, but it's because of these clauses that we put in here to protect the building down the track. Should an event like this happen, the building shouldn't be out of pocket just because an owner decided to make an improvement to their lot. That should in all circumstances be the owner's responsibility. Yeah. Thanks for that, Amanda. Because also to, like she got up, you know, spoke at the meeting and, and what I tried to articulate to her on many occasions is that None of this is the fault of the Ants Corporation. It wasn't their pipe that leaked. It wasn't their, it was your dishwasher. That's your responsibility. I know it's unfortunate. It was an accident, but if it was an Ants Corporation pipe, then we wouldn't be having this discussion. And, we, and I guess we would get really emotional. I said, oh, you know, I did my due diligence. I paid a buyer's agent when I came here and this and that. And, and also made accusations against the Strata Committee that, you know, they're all wealthy and they can afford it. But anyway, we've, we've come to a conclusion to split the um, excess and she's agreed to pay it because she knows that basically like she'd have to fight it and it would cost her more mm. than that. But, um, yeah, it's yeah. good to know that in terms of that aspect, if you if we do agree to make a claim on behalf of an owner when we don't really have to as an owner's corporation, then then that's the part that you deal with at the beginning rather than submitting the claim and then saying you have to pay the excess. Yeah, okay. Yes, I think that's important for an owner's corporation to assess its position on whether or not it needs to be lodging the claim or should be lodging the claim in the first place with reference to section 174 and thinking about how it might play out. I haven't looked at any cases that might have been decided under that section or how it's applied, but I would think that things like an extreme excess situation where the owner's corporation is not at fault, there may be situations where an owner does have contents insurance that will cover the loss and that can be relied on. It's an interesting area that I haven't looked at that closely, but is worth bearing in mind. Yeah. But Amanda, what about if we have another one where the common property was affected, the slab, because the water went through the slab and then in this particular case, which is so unfortunate, it happened in the middle of the night and the owner underneath went to the bathroom and she slipped and she broke her hip. Oh. And that one, I think the slab is saturated. It's not like it's, you know, we have, you know, someone's been injured. So that one, you know, I said we did have to submit a claim and then because, again, the chairperson was saying we don't really have to and I'm thinking, well. Was this the failure of a waterproof membrane, so one bathroom leaked to another? Well, I mean, it went through, I think because it was such a huge amount of water, it just went through the slab. I don't know, it's probably, I don't know if it is a failure of the membrane as well that would have caused it, but the slab is affected. Yeah, because the minute that you have a failure in the common property, so there has been a common property waterproof membrane or there is a common wall that's failed somehow or there's a window that's fallen out, Yeah. then insurance or no insurance, an owner's corporation under Section 106 in New South Wales is responsible for repairing and maintaining the common property. So then, yes, you would be wanting to lodge that insurance claim simply to assist in meeting your liability. That's right. And plus you have the public liability, the public liability clauses of the, of the policy also kick in when someone's injured. And If someone yeah. is injured, yes, yeah. injured within their own lot, I'm not sure how that relates to your building public liability. But if it's because of something that has failed in the common property, you know, if it had been repaired or maintained or dealt with or then that wouldn't have happened, then, yeah, I agree that that's a different situation. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, again, this flexi hose burst is another flexi hose again within the apartment and old flexi hose. I don't know if the bathroom's been renovated or is the original bathroom. Yeah, I don't know. Point. But um, yeah. And again, I don't think there's any bottles because historically many buildings, people used to just renovate their bathrooms and there was no bottles for waterproofing. So... What about bylaws making clear that owners are responsible for their flexi hoses and whatever may come? Yeah, well, I think that's what is going to be the next port of call for our schemes because a lot of the insurance companies now, the minute there's one of these claims, they are saying that we need you to undertake an inspect. In one particular building, unless we had an inspection of every single apartment and had a certificate to say that they'd all been and changed and whatever, that said we, we can't get insurance. It was like, I think. I mean, this is a building that we took over, which had, I think, three before we even took over, and that was like the fourth one, and they said enough. Yeah. Like, and, yeah. So and this is, I think, where I think Strata is another flawed concept because, you know, like it's part of the building structure, but because it's within your own lot and it's not, you know, on the boundary then. Mm. For, and then, you know, the whole demarcation of responsibility, I think sometimes when you can't force someone to have their flexi hose inspected as a normal course, or just a, you know, unless the insurance company makes an issue of it, also is becoming... Because, you know, people don't want to pay, you know, even if it's top $100 or $300 or whatever it is, it's a nominal amount, but sometimes people don't want to yeah. pay that amount of money and trying to then 
of course, the whole situation of men is becoming a bit cumbersome in some schemes. Yeah, I mean, it's been a long time, but I remember drafting a few of these bylaws in my early days as a strata lawyer, bylaws that made lot owners responsible for their flexi hoses. I mean, I suppose you could have a program where you set a time for those hoses to be inspected and to be replaced. You could probably get access for the purpose of determining whether or not common property needs to be repaired or replaced. That's in our act. I hear what you say. It's a bit of a gray area where flexi hoses are not common property. So why are we going into the lot? And the owner may have a a right to oppose that. But I would have thought making clear, I mean, it's lot property, making clear in a bylaw that owners are responsible for making sure their flexi hoses up to scratch and not about to burst is a good way to deal with it as part of your arsenal, I guess, along with proper approval terms for any upgrade works and carefully considering whether or not you do need to or whether it's in the best interest of the owner's corporation to make an insurance claim in these circumstances. Yeah, I think that's the key thing as well because the common property is not affected, I think, you know, because the slab was affected so and someone was injured. But I think also, as you said, Amanda, whether if it was like a flexi hose that damaged someone's wardrobe again should we have even got involved because it was their flexi hose in their wardrobe mm. and in a sense yeah that's a good point yeah thank you for that <laughs> well, well, leave that one with you if you feel up to it let us know how it works out and no doubt there's uh, others out there with views on this very common situation in strata yes my challenge for this week I am hoping to continue a discussion that I started last week last week's podcast episode all about meeting minutes. Mm. How much detail is too much detail in meeting minutes and what is best practice when we are recording minutes of our strata meetings, whether that's committee meetings or general meetings. If you haven't had a listen to that one, head back and have a listen to it, episode 399. I have heard from a few of you as I expected to. Surprisingly to me, so far I'm hearing from a few of you who agree with me that minutes should be kept very simple, They are a record of what was done, not what was said, drawing on Robert's rules of order, rules of parliamentary procedure. There is a comment on the website under this episode disagreeing with me and suggesting reasons why we should have more detail in our minutes, recording the pros and cons, recording some of the debate for and against a particular motion. I thought I might continue this discussion, if it's okay with you, Rena, and ask you as a strata manager who is taking minutes of meetings what your thoughts are on how detailed meeting minutes should be and what your experience on the ground has been when you might be taking instructions from your clients about what should or shouldn't be in minutes. Have you got thoughts on this? Yeah, it's very interesting because I just um, had a meeting where there's an, an owner's representative who's turned up. She's actually the wife of the husband who owns the lots and basically telling me that I needed to put every single thing in the minutes and the interjections. I didn't put an interjection that this one. And I basically had this three textbooks, Amanda, that I'm just looking up here that I've got. Um, Halls is meeting minutes. There's, there's three different textbooks that I use for explaining to people, you know, like what the common law provisions are and the Corporations Act provisions too in terms of minute keeping. And it's basically to record decisions. But there also needs to be some commentary around the context. So and the way that I've always trained managers to write minutes is if you were reading these minutes and you weren't at the meeting, would you understand what was being discussed and why and what what had occurred? Because sometimes people put things and I attended a recent training that I had to attend, which I won't talk about as to the author of the training session. However, people putting things in the past tense is really important because that's a given that minutes are in the past tense because it already has happened. But To say that something was resolved to be decided, I mean, I just think that, like, (laughs) I mean, I get minutes that just make no sense. I don't know how you can resolve to decide something. You either decided to do it or you didn't. It's not You can't resolve to decide, but that's another issue I find with a lot of minutes that they're pretty much incoherent. Like, I try and read them. I think this doesn't make any Mm. sense to me. So I think there's there's got to be enough detail to explain what happened, but not to the point that it's an essay. So Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm really answering your question, Amanda, but... No, you absolutely mm. are. And... In the podcast episode, I talked about some of the Corporations Act provisions and I reached the conclusion that our owners' corporations 
are different beasts to listed companies, for example, that may be held to a higher standard when it comes to minute taking, especially when you're talking about minutes of board meetings where we have professional board members who absolutely should be well-trained and skilled in taking proper minutes of meetings. I think our volunteer committee members can be let off the hook a little bit when it comes to minute taking, maybe not so much our professional strata managers. And to start from a place that number one, your motion has to be clear as to what you're hoping to achieve. And I agree with you, Rena, a motion to discuss or a motion to resolve, to decide is bordering on incoherent and it does make your minute taking very difficult. Mm. But if your motion is clear about what you're hoping to achieve, then it has always been my position that your minute should step one, record whether or not the motion passed or failed. And I agree with you. Sometimes we can't even get that far when right. we're looking at minutes. And so that level of skill and knowledge about minute taking is lacking in some areas. And I'm not just talking about volunteer committee members. Where there is, and, and I didn't go into this detail in the podcast, but having heard what you've said and, and heard some other feedback, I agree that there will be from time to time topics that are controversial that you know from your experience as a strata manager or your experience in the community that litigation might be on the horizon because of the subject matter of this motion. Maybe it is an application by an owner to seek approval for their major renovation work. They've been drumming up support over the last few months. It's going to be borderline decision. It's a special resolution. The result comes in and you know there's going to be a challenge in the tribunal as to whether or not this has been unreasonably refused if the motion fails. So situations like that, our professional strata managers in particular might be alert to the need to record some of the reasons why the motion was voted against or some of the reasons why owners chose to vote for a particular action. I want to acknowledge that, but I also want to be very careful not to encourage or recommend our communities to get into the weeds when it comes to minute drafting because trying to record the debate in its entirety, trying to record that Mrs. Smith got really upset and left the meeting because Mr. Jones said some unfriendly words to her, all of that stuff, in my experience, only creates more conflict there's more tension, there's more pressure ultimately on the secretary who might be the person taking and signing off the minutes. And it can freeze some communities and prevent them from producing accurate minutes at all and send them down into a spiral of debate. So that's where I see it. I think it's about capturing the essence of, of the resolution, but not like, I mean, public companies, all the big, they have a company secretary that's well versed in how to. But the other thing that we talked about in those meeting rules, Amanda, is like minutes are not a transcript. And that's what I think what people are doing. It's not a he said, she said every single word. It's more about trying to, to summarise the discussion and then sometimes even using point form, you know, the, the reasons were as follows, A, B, C, D, not who said A, who said B and who said C type of thing. Mm, mm. But I still think that I'll give you an example now. Like we've got a building where an owner has went to proceed with renovations and they found there's concrete cancer. Now part of the Bible that was passed in 2015, mind you, before we even took over, and he never started this renovation until now, was that he had to let the owners corporation know two weeks before the work started and to pay a renovation bond, none of which happened. It basically, we only found out he started because he said there's concrete cancer. And there's concrete cancer above, apparently I'm not sure what happened with this, he'd removed the ceiling in, in the bathroom and apparently it's about to fall in because there's concrete cancer. So we had to have this ceiling propped at a you know, weekly cost of like 900 bucks or something, whatever it is, until the ins- we've tried to see if it's an insurance claim and we're waiting for insurance assessor's report following his inspection. Now, the issue is that the insurer has now asked me for all my strata committee meeting minutes. Mm. And there'll be nothing in there about that anyway. But the issue is, is that in other cases that I've been involved in, you know, the tribunal or NCAT, it's really the minutes that have helped me to prove that the committee has acted properly and there's enough detail in the minutes for anyone reading would think, hang on, yes, that it's not just, you know, copious emails that have no, like you've got to produce all your emails for an end cap, but this is more about showing that the ENS Corporation had meetings, they were regular. They, Like in this case, his lawyer said, oh, this has been going on for five months. And I said, no, on the 25th of October, he reported this. We had a committee meeting. We got a proposal. 
And on the 6th of December, it was agreed to engage the engineer. Now, at that time, we didn't know about this bathroom ceiling issue. It was more about just the concrete cancer and the fact that he couldn't do his renovation. Now he's had to move out because he can't use his bathroom. So it's another issue that we have. But and I think that keeping good minutes, I think, helps an owner's corporation when there's a problem. It could be years down the line, which is in this case years down the line, to show that we've acted properly. There's never been any record of this issue. I think the insurance company I think is trying to look at is like you knew about this and you've done nothing, mm. which won't be shown because all our minutes won't even show this has ever been raised. So, yeah, I think it's one of those things where I think people have to look at it and say, okay, if I wasn't at the meeting and I'm an owner, would I understand what happened? Is there enough information in terms of quotes, you know, who it's from, mm. the date, yep. the amount, what it's for? That's pretty, you know, obvious. Sticking to the facts, Correct. not necessarily the debate. Yeah. You mentioned the arena training and how you were trained to take minutes and how you train your staff. Do you think that for our strata managers, who are generally the ones who are having to draw up minutes or at least finalize them and issue them, do you think there is adequate training and understanding of how they should be done? No, no, not at all. I mean, I think a lot of buildings majority of strata schemes don't even have regular meetings that's the problem they yeah, you know like yeah. especially the smaller ones they have an agm once a year everything is always approved by email and i kept saying i interviewed something the other day and i said but what about when you're approving quotes like that are five thousand two thousand you know like aren't you having committee meetings and writing oh no it's just done by email so there's that and there's also the fact that yeah managers aren't really trained on how to draft minutes at all i think that there's a real lack of probably understanding of how many should be drafted. I don't think that anyone's ever been trained like, I mean, I was trained mm. by a lawyer. I wasn't trained by another strata manager. But that's yeah. probably the issue I think. But I think we need, we need, I think, more professional training from people who are well-versed in this area, yeah. I think, not just sort of mm. your regular CPD-type training. Mm. Well, good to put it out there to acknowledge that might be a gap. Thank you for that indulgence. Continuing a discussion that was started last week. Over to your win for this week, Rena. Well, Amanda, my win is actually just talking about the fantastic conference that I attended that you put on on the 23rd of February, <laughs> which was so well attended and it was a beautiful location. It was probably the best quality content. We had great speakers, great venue, and I just wanted to share it out there for next year for any strata managers that are wanting to do their CPD. It was such a great event and all of us learned so much. And I think also what I find is it's good doing your CPD, not in dribs and drabs. I find that for me, you know, you're in that mindset and there are different subjects and topics and you have your peers there that you can ask because when you do it, even online, you know, face to face, but you don't really have the same interaction that you can have with other people that are asking questions because I think people probably don't feel as comfortable asking questions on those types of forums, whereas when you're all together in a room and and also there's other points of view from other professionals like the other lawyers that were present and, you know, other people. I think I think it was just such a good way to learn collectively and I would definitely want to just commend you and thank you for such a wonderful job that, and also the book that you gave us, the beautiful packs that we were given with some goodies and, you know, <laughs> food, alcohol and reading. <laughs> <laughs> all, all at the one. same time <laughs> <laughs> oh well thank you for saying that Rena. it was lovely to have your company and the company of your team and we did spend about half an hour together presenting a session about the new new south wales legislation so i know that those in the room really benefited from hearing your hands-on experience and how you're grappling with those new requirements in your office that was our one-day CPD event in Mudgee. I agree with you. I've heard from others that they found it really simple to be able to sit there, engage in the content and the learning, and then do their assessment and then tick everything off done for the CPD year. We will be hosting the event again next year. The date has been released. It's the 28th of March, 2025. We haven't opened up public ticket sales yet. I haven't quite got my act together to get that up and running on the website, but I'll certainly be letting everybody know when that's available. And the CPD year is changing. As I know many of you have heard through Fair Trading and through SCA, the CPD year for strata managers in New South Wales will now be the 1st of July to the 30th of June, which makes a lot of sense. The compulsory topics for the upcoming CPD year haven't yet been settled. I know there's a lot of 
discussion going on within fair trading about what those should be. Hopefully some of the curriculum coordinators are listening to this podcast. Yeah, minute taking. <laughs> getting minute some taking. ideas. <laughs> minute taking. <laughs> Would be a good one. So yes, I uh, remain an approved CPD provider, approved by New South Wales Fair Trading, and it will be something that I'll be offering again in the next CPD year. So looking forward to it. That's wonderful. My win for this week, in addition to celebrating episode 400 of our podcast. Wow. Congratulations, (laughs) Amanda. That's such an achievement. 400 episodes. (laughs) Thank you. It is episode number 400 this time around. They sneak up on us, Rena. They sneak up on us very quickly. Very scary. Um, (laughs) 400 episodes with an episode each week means that this is year eight. We're eight years old on the podcast. And I think for almost most of those years, six or so years, Rena has been my regular co-host here on the podcast. So it's been great to have your company, Rena. And I know our listeners often say, our Strata Manager listeners often say that these are the chats that they most look forward to, getting some practical guidance. And if only to hear that what you're going through is the same <laughs> thing that they're going through and we're all in this together. Yeah, exactly. But in addition to episode number 400, which we are very proud of, I do have a separate win to announce this week. This win comes from a member inside the Your Strata Property online membership community. This member has recently won a tribunal case, self-represented. And I want to highlight this because those of you who have tuned in to my teaching over the last 12 months or so may have heard me say previously that our tribunal is a place I really believe our tribunal is a place where you can be successful, get the right result without legal representation. And some of my trainings go to how best to prepare for the tribunal when you don't have a lawyer representing you, either because the tribunal says, no, I won't allow lawyers to attend, or because for financial reasons, you've decided that's not where you need to be spending your money. Cases where the issue is a lack of repair and maintenance, so there's a failure in the common property, there's a water leak, there's mould, there's a window falling out, there's damage to a floor, whatever it may be, I think from a legal perspective, those are the best and often easiest cases for owners to represent themselves. And I do a lot of work inside our membership community, one-on-one with our members, whether it's in the forum or in a member call assisting owners who are representing themselves in these kinds of cases. So I'm always really thrilled when often it's an email in my inbox giving me a copy of the decision where a member has said, Amanda, got our result today and we have been successful. So this win came from an investor owner where the bathroom was leaking due to a failed waterproof membrane. And it was a situation where the owner had asked the owner's corporation many times, please fix it. Interestingly, by the time the tribunal hearing came around, the issue was what the method of repair should be. And the owners corporation wanted to apply a reasonably cheap, straightforward sealing of the tiles. So a mega sealed solution or something similar to just put a a seal on the tiles and then they won't leak anymore. The owner had some expert evidence to the effect that that wasn't going to be sufficient. And the tribunal accepted The owner's evidence, the tribunal looked at evidence that the ceiling solution had actually failed in other units and it was quite persuaded that therefore this was not a viable option in this unit. And the tribunal went all the way to awarding temporary accommodation costs for the short period during which the bathroom couldn't be used while the tiles and the waterproof membrane were being replaced. That was ultimately the order and damages to replace carpet that had been affected by water penetration. So tick, 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 this owner, this member of our community got what they were entitled to, a very sound decision from a legal perspective upon my reading of it, and all done without legal representation. The owner's corporation actually sought leave for legal representation and the tribunal said, no, this is not complex. You don't need it. Do your best. So congratulations to that owner and I share this because I I just want to give those owners out there who are going through these battles on their own, doing the best that they can, you're on the right path. You're on the right path and there are lots of resources out there and especially inside our community that can help you on that path. Others have paved it before you. 
Yeah, it's very interesting, Amanda, that you say that because I think there are many cases, I think, where there has been a failure to repair and maintain common property. But I think when it comes to bathrooms, I'm not sure what your experience has been, but in some of my schemes where, you know, their original bathrooms are still, you know, like I've got a building that's, it's, you know, a three-digit strata plan. So that's how old it is. And the building was actually, the building is actually 100 years old. So not that the bathroom is 100 years old, but the strata plan is one of the early ones, I'd say in the 40s. Mm. And of course, someone has an original bathroom that's now leaking. Now, Every other owner in the building has renovated their apartment. There is no way anyone else, because this is a rental apartment, um, the owner hasn't lived there, she lives in a nice big house in a nice suburb somewhere else, but has failed to basically um, do any renovations, which is obviously her right. But the committee have then come to me and said, because this owner hasn't done any renovations, it's going to now fall on the owner's corporation to undertake this repair. So what are your views, Amanda, on the Apparent inequality where, and this is, again, why I think this is a very flawed concept because mm. those people that have renovated their apartments and taken ownership and, you know, knowing that a bathroom can't last X amount of years is only a short, is a set lifetime for mm. waterproofing membranes to be effective and stop water penetration. So what are your thoughts about that? Where, when people come to me and say, oh, hang on a minute, this is an old building. We're going to initially try the ceiling thing that didn't work in this building that you mentioned mm. and see how we go, but I'm, I don't hold my hopes up. I think it's just good to try it and see how we go. Mm. So what are your thoughts on that, Amanda? Oh, look, I mean, you're suggesting that the owner who has the original bathroom has maybe lived in that property for a long time or purchased that property with the original bathroom then has the benefit when that bathroom waterproof membrane fails of having the owner's corporation essentially fund a New bathroom. Yeah, essentially um, it is a new bathroom. I'll take everything out and, yeah. Yeah, in most circumstances, if a waterproof membrane has to be done, then tiles have got to come yep. up and then we've got yep. to replace tiles. Yeah. My short answer to that is, well, that that is the law, that yes. you're right, that that is how it works. Owners that have gone to the time, the trouble, the expense of renovating their bathrooms will have been benefiting from that for that period of time, either through their own enjoyment or if it is an investment, then they're getting higher rents because of that upgrade that they've made to their property. And I think that's a great thing. And I think forward thinking owners who prioritize their investment, who want to increase the value of their investment, they're doing these things like upgrading their properties. And in that way, they're getting that financial benefit. In the same way that an owner who does nothing and invests nothing, then gets the financial benefit of the owner's corporation ultimately paying for their new bathroom. Mm. But they've lost all of that time beforehand of increased value that they could have had if they had made that investment, if they had upgraded their bathroom, could have got higher rents. Maybe those who were selling could have got a better selling price. That's the decision that they make. And I think it is a, it's an interesting gamble, I suppose, that you take. I don't know if anybody actually does this. You'd have to have a pretty good knowledge of strata law. But do you think there's owners out there who make that gamble and say, well, I'm not going to touch my original bathroom because I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait 35, 40 years for the waterproof membrane to fail and then my payday is going to come in. I don't know that anyone consciously does that. No, I don't, no, I don't think it's a conscious decision as such, but I think when they see that, you know, listening to our podcast and hearing about cases and things like that or seeing mm. other owners in their building, because I do have another building which um, we manage where, you know, people saying, well, that person hasn't renovated their bathroom, now we're having to pay the cost. I suppose in a sense some people – don't mind living in circumstances or some of them may not have the money to pay. I mean, bathroom renovations are not cheap. I mean, true, the, true. Both, out of any part of your, of your apartment, that would be the most expensive part to renovate. So sometimes I think it's not by willful neglect or happy with mm. the status quo. It's more that it's a big financial burden and cost to upgrade and replace your bathroom. So, yeah, I mean, I like the ideas that you've given, Amanda, in terms of there are financial benefits if you're a landlord. Um, you know, I mean, some people don't mind living in a horrible bathroom, but some people, you know, you're right, they just haven't had the benefit if they want to sell. Um. And, you know, from the owner's corporation's perspective, if you do have a majority of bathrooms that have been renovated, that is a great thing and that is, that is a big burden <laughs> removed from an owner's corporation. And I always say to owners who are proposing bathroom renovation applications, putting a bylaw forward at a general meeting and sometimes they come to me and they say, oh, Amanda, I don't think this will be approved because there's been two other renos done this year and everyone's sick of the mess and the noise and the disturbance and I think they're just going to knock it back because they don't like me or whatever the reason is. I say, look, why don't you try making this pitch at the general meeting? Explain to owners that by doing your bathroom yourself, 
you are removing one more bathroom from the obligation of the owner's corporation. So if there's 20 units in the block and 10 have new bathrooms, then the owner's corporation is only responsible for those remaining 10 that are still original. And so the more people who have these renovations approved and who complete them pursuant to, let's just add, proper bylaws that (laughs) shift responsibility over to the owner so there can be no dispute about that, then that is freeing up the owner's corporation to devote its its energy, its money, its attention to other things around the common property and it doesn't have to be responsible for all of those bathrooms. So in a building like the one you're, you're dealing with, Rena, I suppose the answer might be, well, lucky it's just one. <laughs> lucky it's this is the only one and everybody else has gone their own way. It's not the case in some buildings. Yeah, that's true actually. I'll try I'll try and use those positive arguments you put forward to try and make them feel better. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's great, Amanda. Well, thank you for the excellent chat. We've covered a lot of ground today, Rena, as we should in this very special episode number 400. Yeah. I will look forward to catching you some other time in the 400s coming up very soon, no doubt. Exactly. Have a good week, Amanda. You too. Bye, Rena. Bye. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at yourstrataproperty.com.au.